Hey everybody, today is August 2nd. This is the KCP community meeting. Glad to have you all here. Uh, we do have the GitHub issue 1661 for today's meeting agenda. If you have anything you'd like to add, please feel free to add a comment. And we're just gonna go through these in order, coming back to the issue triage at the end. So Stefan, you've got the first uh, item on the agenda here. Yeah, if Joachim is here, he can talk about that. He is here. He did the work, so I just pasted it here. Oh, okay. So right now, instead of using the sync target name, what we are doing is hashing the sync target name plus the sync target workspace uh, in reverse order. So, and then SHA 224 of it and base 62. So you get a string with upper and lower case and alphanumeric string. So you will see that change. Uh, if you have some KCP already running, I don't know what will happen. Honestly, I guess uh, it will resync everything. And that's that, that has been done to provide uniqueness to the label as before cluster one could refer to a sync target in multiple different workspaces. Okay, so. Uh, in terms of what happens for existing data, I'm assuming that the label would be recalculated and, or, or would it not be recalculated because there was one that already existed? I think it, it would be. I, I didn't try that, but I think it will be recalculated. But yeah, so it will cause a resync on all the workloads and everything. Okay. Um, what one addition maybe also for the why we don't want to leak cluster workspace or sync target names, right? So yeah, we. In, in the past, we talked about with Clayton at the time, we talked about using the UID or something, which is basically the same thing. It's some string uh, encoded in a nice format, as nice as possible, at least in a label. And um, it gives us a uniqueness plus not leaking anymore. Okay. And, and with that, we are finally able to remove the finalizers from objects when the sync target is gone. Uh, yes, that we are also merged. That so, makes me extremely happy. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, yeah, I think it's probably worth a quick check to see what happens if you've got the old label and then you update KCP and what happens, uh, it, at least so we can write it down and tell people what to expect. Okay, I will. I will do the test. Thanks. Um, any other questions or comments on on this one? No. All right, Stefan, you're up next. Yeah, I passed that before in, in Slack. Um, this came out from a discussion of Luca and me. So trying to yeah to talk about the topology for components and especially about networking if you deploy shards multi-region and um, how the primitives we have for example in the cluster workspace shard object uh, yeah, how, how they can be used to enable this topology this to, the topology is it's not a must like it's just one option maybe a natural one but um yeah, if you, if you have different uh, goals, maybe some things will be differently designed. But anyway, what, what we have done here, um, maybe we can zoom a bit so we can see it better. So Switch to the um, drawing. Yeah. If you can zoom in into the cluster workspace chart at the top right to see. I'm trying, hold on. <laughs> uh, I can talk through it. So this can yeah, I got it. Let, Okay, there's green, black, and red. And uh, the arrows uh, have the same color. So green is the base URL in a cluster workspace chart. And this is basically the, 
yeah, if if the shots are running in a pod, it's a pod IP probably. So it's a the address you can talk to a shard directly. Um, the black one is the external URL. This is used in cluster workspaces, and it will most probably point to the front proxy. So if you go down, there's a front proxy. They are multiple. So maybe the black bubbles there are not even equal, but maybe they are, depending on, on topology as consequences, of course. But that's the external URL everybody knows. And when you say kubectl ws and then a workspace name, it will use the black uh, address. And the search one is the red one that's about the virtual workspaces. And we talked a little in a, in a previous meeting. Um, we, we put the, the red addresses into different objects. Like in API exports, you will have the status, the URLs, which point to the virtual workspaces of shards. So those are copied there. And um, yeah, if you, if you put that into a topology here with a private network, maybe we need a load balancer in front. This is the design we chose here. And then you would just put the, the load balancer address into the URL. And um, for, for doing that, you have to update the shard object before and put the load balancer address, not the external address or the, the base address. And um, if you zoom out a bit again. So basically, there is this, uh, this person in the middle, the, the smiley, the hat face. Um, this talks to the DNS, and then yeah, that one talks to the DNS and then talks to the front proxies. Um, such a person, like a, a human user, will never talk to the virtual workspace, but controllers do. So we have pictured two instances of a controller, which talks to an API export here, one in the US, one in Europe. And they will also use the front proxies, so the black addresses, um, to talk to, basically, to get the data from the API export. So the export is on the right side. Uh, the one which has those three um, red bubbles. Um, so for that, it will go through the front proxy, but after that, it will do list watches against the addresses, the addresses of the virtual workspaces. Uh, in the picture, we have three of them, so the three uh, red load balancers here. And we played with the idea, so we talked about that before, that somehow we have to reflect topology into controllers. And one idea here was, maybe we extend the list of virtual workspaces with labels. So every virtual workspace has labels and in there, there would be something like region. So if you zoom in again, where we don't do it. So in the labels uh, of the lists there on the right side. I'm trying, see, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> you're seeing region and the region is the one where the shard lives, which uh, this virtual workspace serves. So region US East one is twice, and the uh, European one is, is once at the bottom. This and isn't. This is less label selectors and more just labels, right? Because um, yes. there's a selector yeah, 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 down yeah, yeah. at the bottom. Yes. Those are the labels, basically. Um, maybe they come from the shark labels. We haven't discussed that yet. How do you define them? If you move up a bit. Um, I call them topology labels there. So those are the ones copied into the to the list on the export. But in any case, um, the, the controllers will see those labels. So a controller author can use them to do sharding. So controller also gets the API export, and maybe the controller is responsible just for the uh, US shards. So it will just do a label selector on those labels and serve just the red so if you zoom out again, I'm sorry. That's OK. Uh, just the keyboard shortcuts aren't working for me. So when you look at the left controller, it has three outgoing arrows. Um, two of them point to the US chart, they are red. And then there's a gray one, which points to the EU, EU one. So the left controller has a workspace, a virtual workspace selector, US East one, so it will not be responsible for European charts. And that's why this is gray, so it, it doesn't talk to that one. It could in theory, but the um, controller runtime or client go based sharding library will just ignore that. And on the right side, um, that one has a label region, EU as one, and it selects just the European charts by that. So it's just a very simple model how we could implement topology 
on the controller level. All right, I saw a hand. Chris, yeah. Yeah. Chris go ahead. Cannot hear you. Classic double mute. The smiley face going through DN DNS, does that mean that the kubectl plugin will no longer use the virtual workspace of servers for anything? That's correct. I think very soon when when David's removal of the personal workspaces, the code um, which gives you this duality of workspaces, when this merges, so we don't have this duality anymore, there's no access to a virtual workspace. That's correct. And DNS, of course, can be anything. Like it's it's some kind of DNS resolution. It can be something like Akamai or something, some service provider, or it can be uh, whatever. It can be one DNS record uh, which is somehow localized, um, regional in some sense. Okay, so the initial configuration for a controller would be through the front proxy. They would use that to retrieve yeah. resources that have other topology yeah. topology information embedded. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, and the, they are, so fan out happens. Yes, the um, controller runtime example that we have, for example, um, you give it the name of an API export, and it will retrieve it, which in theory would go through the front proxy, and then it uses the currently only one URL in the status, and then up creates a client that will talk to the virtual workspace. So this is just an expansion of all of that. Exactly. So I, I think we need something like a meta controller, which watches the export. Whenever a shard appears, which matches a labels, label selector, you will spawn another instance of, a, what's the name, a manager or something, controller runtime? Yeah, manager. Yeah. Uh, although I, we can talk implementation separately, but they do there is support for multiple clusters with um a single okay name. if if there is then there's not going to yes yeah i assume yeah. part of Maybe, the work uh, here will be go ahead. i assume part of the work here will be um ensuring there's a valid identity for those controllers across all of the shards um yeah but it's just a service account this doesn't change it's a service account against the api export so there will be subject access review, and potentially this is an area where we have to think what happens when, so there's this blue line, which is identic. If the identic strikes and there's no connection anymore between the shards, what happens? Like, how does shard two do a subject access review against shard one? So replication and those things will come into play here. And also in this direction, the, the green, arrows I haven't talked about. So what Lukash is implementing at the moment, so we are trying to get two shots running. And the solution is basically to take or to implement this upper left green arrow. So if you can select that and the, um, ignore everything to Europe, basically this arrow is what Lukash is implementing. So basically shard one will watch shard zero and shard zero will watch shard one. So you have to inform us. And controllers will also have two informers, at least those which we touch at the moment. So we start with important ones, the, the core ones, API binding, API export, uh, cluster workspace scheduling, those we start with, and just play with this model where you have two informers. In the future, maybe we don't have two informers because this explodes, of course, uh, the number of shards. So there are options where you do replication of just the important data. That's one option. So replication into etcd, into the local etcd. And there's a third model. So if we put from the left, step zero, I'm um, sure one can read that. Um, this is step zero. This is uh, the informer-based solution. One to the right is A1, I think I called it. That's a replication. So we copy, for example, we copy the root workspace to every shard. Like every object, everything we copy. Just that you have the API bindings and exports and everything. Um, and the third one, one to the right, it's a, uh, 1B. Um, that's a model where basically every controller can subscribe to a certain objects. So as an example, the API binding controller has to watch the corresponding API export, right? 
And this is a pretty clear relationship, so you know what you want to watch. And the controller, the binding controller, can, for its local bindings, can claim access, like a list watch in the background, events and everything, for this one API export. And in the background, you would have some kind of list watch manager. And um, as long as the controller, um, every resync at least, tells this manager here, I want to watch this object. I want to watch it every 30, 30 minutes, for example. This list watch would stay active and you would get events. But if the controller forgets about this very export, this list watch will be uh, just stopped. This is very similar to what Kubelet does. Kubelet and secrets is the same model, basically. If, there, if there's a pod which mounts a secret, there's an informer. If the pod dies, the informer is stopped. So both models we can implement. Um, they're not exclusive. They are, I think there are places in controllers where the second model is better, like this binding controller. But for other things, for example, if you want to, you want to serve subject access review, you basically need a lot of objects. And this is very hard to describe which objects you need for that. And their replication might be better. So if you know in advance you want to, to you depend on many objects, um, maybe a complete workspace or something, then replication is better than the second model. That's a rule of stuff we see at the moment. Anyway, so step zero is what we do now. And then we try the other ones and learn with our controllers which approach works where. And yeah, that's just a plan for the next months, basically, in charting. All right. Maybe a last, just a last comment. Chris asked that, when do we have to port all controllers? For the moment, basically every workspace is automatically scheduled to root. This will stay for quite some time. So you have to, in end to end, you have to opt in into scheduling onto another chart. So we can very selectively um, run tests which support sharding, but most others like by far the majority will just run on one chart for the time being. All right, well, if, if anybody's interested in exploring this further, please reach out uh, if you've got any questions that come up um, while you're thinking about this, um, please feel free to ask later. And um, I think we'll go on to Paul's 0 0.8 planning expectations and themes. David, do you want to chat about yours, which is also a technical topic before I start talking about paperwork? Yeah, we can, we can uh, switch. So yeah, sure. David, um, you yeah. good to go on this? Yeah, sure. Um, Guy uh, would be there as well to, to present part of it. I can share my screen possibly just to give a, a quick overview. Uh, here. Uh, you see my screen? Yes. So uh, mainly what we call invert syncing is, is a sort of new feature that uh, popped up, you know, whose requirement popped up uh, initially, um, especially in the case of KCP storage. Uh, mainly feature-wise, if you think of all the objects that are at stream in KCP on the other side, all the objects on, on physical clusters. Uh, for now, the model was always, let's just, you know, have KCP be the, be the single source of truth, the, the place from every from which every object flows to sync target to physical clusters, but in the case of storage, for example, there is um, uh, something a bit different, because when when you are using dynamic provisioning, in fact, what you will create uh, on the KCP side at first is the PVC, and then the PV, the persistent volume that at some point will be bound by CSI to the PVC, will be created by the physical cluster. Uh, first, and so the, the object, the PV object here, which is you know dependent or created from the PVC, uh, it's created on the on the physical cluster side. But now, um, when you need to think of several clusters, possibly, for example, you have one sync target that you have to drain and to switch uh, to another one, then at some point we will have to, you know, bring this PV definition here back to uh, the KCP layer so that it can be 
then pushed um, or synced back to, to a distant cluster here, cluster B. So obviously the first time you would create a PVC on the first cluster, it, you would have dynamic provisioning, but as soon as, at least in the simple cases, and Guy would be able to, you know, say more about that. But in, in the simple case, uh, the PV would be um, brought back to the KCP layer and then would have to be synced along with the PVC. Uh, so pre-provisioned, pre in fact, PV uh, on, on the second cluster. So the whole point here is at least to open a door for up-syncing or for invert-syncing, for bringing objects from, uh, so status and spec as well, the whole object, from one and only one physical cluster, sync target, back to, to KCP. And of course, we have to define the limits of this. Uh, this would not be something expected to be, you know, long-term up-syncing, but at least taking one object, being able to up-sync at some point, and when some external component like coordination controller uh, would, you know, detect it's the time, then this object would, you know, be now a KCP object that you can sync back to one cluster or another. So that's, that's the main goal in terms of, of features. And in terms of components, um, what we had already, of course, is the Syncer virtual workspace with the spec syncer and status uh, syncer. And they all, you know, uh, take the source of truth from, from here, from uh, the workspace. And obviously, the app sync is something quite different. In fact, it's not not necessarily following the same flow and the same logic for um, creation, um, deletion, uh, all, all the, the various steps. And <clears throat> and so the the idea, the approach that that we agreed on during the design is mainly to have in the sinker agent overall the sinker process on the uh, physical cluster on the sync target have an additional controller and also um, that would look for some objects that would be labeled, labeled with an let's say up sync label typically and from those object would then create uh, through a distinct virtual workspace, which is mainly just like the Syncro virtual workspace, but dedicated to upsync, uh, it would either create or update the objects uh, full status and spec uh, in in the, the in KCP. And obviously, during transformations on the fly, for example, uh, you have a number of things that you might want to change in the VV before bringing it back to KCP. And also, there is the question of maintaining um uh, links you know cross references between the pvc and the pv so that that's ma mainly the model and then on the sinker side obviously uh there could be because pvs and pvcs are typically just standard cube objects so a storage controller that would be able to detect that a pvc has been bound and um so you know label the corresponding pv <clears throat> for upsync in order to for this to be uh, taken in account by the upsync controller so that's mainly the the, the long-term id of upsyncing and the plan is really to keep that really scoped you know limited to uh, the, the 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 minimal use case the use cases because the, the still the main uh, flow is obviously always from kcp2 uh, is the the usual syncing from kcp2 uh, sync targets and obviously, this is not in the very near future because it would also require creating a new uh, virtual workspace, uh, also having transformation completely learned in the <coughs> in the in uh, on main merged. So, as a, as an intermediate step, uh, we could also envision having those two separate components here: a storage controller to you know level the PV once it's bound to the PVC automatically and uh, the Epson controller, having them being a bit more you know, specific to cube uh, storage primitives, PVCs and PBs, and especially doing the transformation, the required transformations directly here, uh, and then directly also pointing to uh, the um, wor uh, workspace. Obviously, it's a limited case. It's, you know, 
a short-term step that we could very quickly implement. But this requires this limitation that the workspace this in which you have the sync target and the workload workspace would be the same, which is the case mainly for now. Uh, and if we stick to this limited use case, then it's possible quite easily to implement this transformation, this, you know, upsyncing and transformation logic inside the upsync controller, and then move this code when uh, the new virtual workspace to be done here would be available, move this code into the, the, the final approach. Uh, yes, sure, Andy. I'm curious about this intermediate approach and like what, how much work is involved in doing the new virtual workspace and could we just do that now? Uh, because the sync target being in the same workspace as workloads is something that we've moved away from and it's not a requirement anymore. So I would hesitate to do work that takes us backwards. Yeah, surely. Um, in fact, to be fair, that I think there are two things here, um, setting up the Epsing virtual workspace, obviously, but also having the transformation work uh, land in, uh, in, you know, in main, be merged, uh, because the whole point of moving some parts of, of the logic from the Epsing controller to the virtual workspace is also to be able to transform automatically. And there, there are some challenges that we still have to um, uh, cope with. Uh, for example, namespace transformations. Well, I don't want to go too much in the details. But so the idea is, is not to go backward, but at least to allow um, storage teams, uh, people that would work on these parts here, for example, for the storage controller or people that would work on the logic of the, the main logic of the upsync controller inside the syncer to start working, start defining their logic, uh, the requirements, start implementing those uh, without depending highly on this. But obviously, clearly, the goal is not to uh, settle on this intermediate step, but just have it as a way to parallelize the work on, on both sides. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Stefan. Yeah, maybe we should put it under feature gate. That's easy to do and will prevent yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. wrong expectations. And just to give a number, um, Andy, um, I think we have something like a month overlap or so of the work. So, yes, we, I mean, if we had a second or third David, um, we could do the virtual workspace now. We don't. So that's why um, we just here and I said. Sure. I, I like the idea of a feature gate. Yeah. Um, Guy, um, I would uh, pass it to you uh, for more details on, on the storage and, and flow. Yeah. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm not sure. Do you think we should go into the, the flow details? It's, it's fine. I mean, um, I think this was a uh, great summary of, of the discussion. So I, I don't know if the details are uh, would add or <laughs> be worse. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, the, just to, to add one thing, I mean, uh, for for this uh, design, I mean, the the intention is, um, and in one of the um, the diagrams we have the replication uh, mentioned, but there is no design for it. So I think the if we if we want to uh, test how up syncing works in the longer term um, storage uh, use cases we, we might uh, want to continue and follow up that discussion and, and look at the replications as well um, so we see if that you know fits well um, under those use cases too yeah and that's probably also a reason why it's quite important even if it's not the complete uh, you know full picture to start with the intermediate State because then we can start uh, experimenting with the coordination controller, with the way we manage the sync labels, up sync, with the precise orders, and and see how it you know also fits the the case which are less uh, simple than the read write uh, execute uh, case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I'm curious, did you all talk through the reclaim policies on the PVCs and if it's like delete and you've you've migrated uh, PV that was automatically dynamically provisioned from one cluster to another and then you delete the PVC from KCP? Well, did you talk through making sure that the PV goes away too? Um, it, we basically mentioned that uh, reclaim policy would have to be retained, um, you know, downstream until we actually decide uh, to go through deletion, like, uh, you know, real storage deletion. So uh, yeah. I, I don't think we went through more details than just to mention that this way. Okay. Yeah, just something to think about. Yeah. And, and retain policy would possibly be things that would be part of some transformation yep. uh, when singing. Yeah. So that it would be owned by the replication controller, uh, finally, by, by the coordination controller. Sorry. All right. Well, this looks really cool. I am looking forward to seeing this take shape. So thanks for sharing. And uh, like with all of our other topics, if anybody's interested and wants to get involved, please reach out to David and Guy. And I, I added in the community uh, call issue all the links to the disc, the full discussion uh, session and also to the documents shown here. Thank you. Um, Paul, did you want to screen share or you want me to throw it back up? Oh, I can screen share real quick. Thank you for those presentations. That was really great. I appreciate that. Um, for folks who may be new on the call, we are trying to make a conscious effort to, to share more design details and facilitate a little more conversation. So if you see something you like, then as Andy said, jump right in. Or if you have feedback, let us know how we can improve. Um, my topic is about uh, 0.8 planning and making sure that we're moving on uh, epics and narrowing down the themes of that. So we are in the last week of 0 0.7. So when we go over the milestone epics, we should kind of see where our status is on that and how, we do, how we're doing on closing. Um, 0 0.7 had quite a bit of continuation work, and we also had some design work that was just presented here that we would expect to, to see some progress on in 0 0.8. So I've just seeded our document with the continuation of what we've been doing, as well as uh, a little bit of a, the new work that we're talking about, API evolution, the storage work that, that David and Guy were talking about. And there's also service networking that has had some ongoing side discussions I think Annika is here, but we can uh, talk a little bit more on them. So expectations would be that a lot of folks already own work in that continuation side. So we would expect that that continues with the same set of folks. Um, we would want to see new epics, or at least the existing epics, move to the correct milestone and scoped for 0 0.8. So we'd be looking for that breakdown uh, maybe by the uh, next community call. So we can see what's going to be in the milestone. Um, and for any new design items, the same sort of presentation level that we saw here today. So questions for the group is whether or not there are other topics that need to be addressed here. And do people understand the scope of what's on there? Do you want to talk a little bit about service networking, Stefan? Yeah, I haven't prepared any slides or documents. We have some, but um, they're not polished. Anyway, so I can try to, to describe. So basically, it's about the first steps into more network support and service connectivity is the primary uh, thing we want to have, like availability of the service object. And when services have a name in KCP and you reference them, um, workloads which run in containers and pods, they must be able to talk to the service. And talking to the service is either done via the service IP in Kube or via DNS. So um, pods must basically use whatever is defined in yeah the semantics of pod specs, basically, which tells uh, a pod about the existence of a service, like an environment variable or as a downstream API. Um, or just by convention, those things must work. And this means we have to rewrite properly pod specs so that the environment variables for the services in the same namespace, they are mapped to services which are actually on the physical cluster. 
And a similar thing for DNS. If a service mm -hmm. looks up uh, under a service name of KCP and um, the namespace name of KCP, um, it has to get the same answer, like the logical answer, so the DNS answer, which it would expect in a real cube cluster. But now we are in downstream, so we have synced the object down to a physical cluster. Namespace has a different name, so the DNS resolution must be changed. So there's work around core DNS and somehow faking this logical picture, the DNS um, and the network topology of KCP into a physical cluster. And yeah, those are the big steps. Um, there's a third topic maybe involved um, with that network policies. At some point, I'm not sure we do it here in 08, but probably in one of the next milestones, um, network policies are a similar thing because a reference topology and the logical topology in KCP is different than in the downstream cluster. So if we want to make them to work, and we know we need network topologies for security reasons, there's also lots of work to be done. Again, same pattern, implementing something, a mapping, which makes the container think it's running in the KCP namespace, while actually it's in the downstream namespace, which has a mm -hmm. different name. So three topics, all network related, and by that we get service connectivity, which looks like cube. So next steps here, are folks can put their names beside topics they're already working. Uh, if you want to jump into a topic, please put your name there so somebody can reach out to you. Uh, anything that does not get an assignment, we will either talk to folks for a, a direct assignment on ownership if it's something we want to commit to or we would move it out of the milestone if it's not going to be worked and from there the owner would be uh, creating those epics as we have in the past and helping us scope and help us set expectations on what uh what things would be delivered and when all right that was it for me thanks paul let me Get my share up again. Oh, hold on. Have to unminimize my window. Okay. Um, we've got about 20 minutes left. If anybody's got a topic, now's the time. Otherwise, I'm going to do issue triage. Okay. Uh, so we'll take a look at incoming issues first. Only six of them. Uh, I'll start with the oldest one. Update CLI for listing sub workspaces in the current workspace example. This looks like it would be nice to get around to at some point. So no hard milestone. Um, although I do have a question. Um, so Paul and anyone, when we uh, at some point, we probably should go back and look at anything that's in here that is TBD and see if any of these 147 we want to specifically assign to 0 0.7. So um, now is probably not the time to do that, but we can either decide to do it async or we can have a separate session to do it, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. And we could throw something out on the public calendar and anyone who's interested could sit in. Okay, sounds good. All righty, so TBD, document, sync target cells concept. Um, I know that we had cells added in a PR that merged, so this is a request to document that, which I think is a great request. Um, just a reminder, unless something is um, critically needed for 0 0.7, our upcoming milestone, it's just going to get placed into TBD until we do that planning session that uh, Paul and I were just talking about, or revisiting the TBDs. 
This one I saw come through. I don't know if anybody's had a chance to look at it yet, but uh, oh no, sorry, this is not the one I was thinking about. Um, oh yeah, I did see this one come through. Um, it seemed odd that changing the placement would cause Oh, it makes the sync target get stuck in container creating. Interesting. Um, well, this is probably cluster. If anybody's interested in doing some debugging and triaging, um, I'd love to have some help on that. Uh, and if if folks are interested in helping to debug and to triage, I will make as much time available as y'all need to walk through my process for triaging, if that's helpful, uh, especially if you're looking at test flakes. So if you take a pull request as an example, and I don't know, here's one that's failing. Um, so you can see there's a couple failed tests here. If folks are interested in helping deflake, that is critically important. Um, so I would happily walk folks through on uh, my process for that. So please feel free to reach out to me uh, if you're interested. All right, placement, back resource label selector. Stefan, what's the milestone on this TBD? To read what I wrote four days ago. Probably TBD. Oh, yeah, this is a request from our colleagues who, who play with Kappa. To, okay. Um, they, they want basically individual scheduling for resources by names. It's okay. doable. Um, if one, somebody's interested in scheduling, that's a good topic. Okay, cool. This is the one that I was laughing about earlier. Um, I saw this come through, haven't had a chance to test it out. Uh, I hope that this is not true. Um, but this one, uh, we should probably take a look at sooner rather than later. I would say if this is pulled in KCP, it's an upstream doc. Yeah, um, I'm gonna. Sounds like I'm gonna take this one. Um, and then this one is already mine. Uh, I actually can't reproduce this one on using the test server. Uh, this may be specific to having the virtual workspace server running standalone, which is what I was asking you about on Slack yesterday, Stefan. So uh, I'm probably going to try and get a test set up where we can run the virtual workspace server standalone because I can't reproduce this. All right, that is all of the um, incoming issues. So let's take a look at the milestone epics, um, although maybe is it worth going through these now and seeing if we can uh, update them maybe. as needed, or should we just have the owners go through async and do it? I, I, I will leave that, but maybe um, remove label epic and just look for non-epics, because we are so near, so maybe we should. Do you want me to? Okay, yeah. Zero, zero 07 non epics. That are milestone blockers? Yeah, no, not blockers, but anything, everything we have to plan for zero 07, but to come to. So there's anything we really want to have. Nobody yeah, I mean, there's, there's 26 that are open, so okay. start at the end. So yeah, I mean, this, this is still coming. <laughs> um, reverse tunnel for pod logs and whatnot still being worked on. This one, yeah, it's the same topic. It's it's all shard related to the, to the topic I, I showed earlier. That kind of 
duplicates, but they have some ideas we didn't want to lose. That's why yeah. we can close them. Um, moving key cluster namespace creation and deletion upwards. This one's been getting kicked from one release to the next. Yeah, this is, so it's about security. And at some point, we said Synca is not privileged right. on a key cluster. But now with PVs, it's getting even more privileged. So <laughs> I mean, we maybe, should think maybe about we just close this. Yeah. I mean, Maybe at, some, at, some, at point, some point, there has to be a privileged component that can create namespaces that the sinker yeah. uses. So, because the way it was, the way it was so until now was precisely that namespaces are not namespace resources, namespaced resources, uh, but cluster wide resources, and and that all the thinking was namespace based. But now if we have PVs as well, where we have some sort of thinking of non names of cluster wide resources, maybe in the future, we could also re revisit the, the, the thinking of namespaces, I don't know. I think the communication of the vision was like, this is not privileged in the beginning. But yeah, yeah. Um, we changed basically our mind. I think becoming non-privileged would be a feature. So maybe we could close it and open it when somebody works on it. Yeah. Um, yeah starting the trend toward adding more privileges to the sinker. And opening a new issue if when we need okay i like closing issues um i'm gonna skip over the epic um revert cluster admin permissions for singer in the uh, i think this one i had commented didn't i uh if you look at the end all right so yeah, it maybe it has been, it's yeah. Yeah. Now the sinker connects connects to to uh, with with a dedicated service account that has only the right. Oh, yes. To... You're right. So can we close this? It should be closed. Yes. yes, I think so. Okay. Um, multi -risk. epic, 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 epic. Add not yet accepted permission claims to API bindings. Is this a status -y thing? It is an issue also epic for next milestone, I guess. Yeah, I think it's a task. Okay. So okay. Um, this one. Wait, what's this? Oh, yeah, this was a bug that we, David, you had said we need the transformation PR. Uh, but this no. one, no, I mean, we discussed no. uh, with Stefan with that, and it's, it's, it's distinct. Probably my comment was not re uh, relevant. Uh, but isn't it the one that has been, that is, that is about to be fixed? Maybe, with, yeah, with my change, the finalizer goes away, and maybe then something happens. So somebody has to look into it, what happens now. Maybe there's something missing, maybe not. Yeah, because you know, clearly the, 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 the virtual workspace is in charge of removing this level. But um, you know, if, right. if the work cluster is down, so the TV, virtual workspace yeah. is, not, is not called anymore. So TBD, okay. I think it's fine, yes. Um, priority and fairness is an epic. We have workload. That's solved, right? That's your Akim's work, basically. Yeah. That's solved. So this is all done? Yeah. Yeah. What was the PR? Uh, 16. Oh, oh. That one. That one. 1,600? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, 
resources access through the claim should be via the workspace center. This was the uh, soft impersonation, right? That we wanted to do. Yes. Yes, this was during this discussion, but then not sure if we are still in this in this direction. Now. Yeah, I would I would still postpone it to zero eight. I think we have to make up our minds. Not TBD. Let's keep it in zero eight, please. Okay. Uh, remove the need for a SAR against cluster workspace type. Uh, this is uh, this is one of the follow ups. Um, on, is on, it happening on this faces. week? <laughs> yes. So the, I mean, there is this Did one. I, Sorry, David, didn't I change that already? Double check. Maybe I did that. Yeah, I don't think so, but but maybe I missed it. So. Yeah, TV I TV mean, I think it's fine. Okay. And assign. Yeah, I mean that's that's something that is less critical about the fact that you know you you, you force uh, using the universal uh, cluster workspace type by default apart from that that's um, gone that's gone double check okay. I, I i hope it's gone hmm. all right uh same namespace this is the networking this is a service topic we talked about earlier today yes yeah, okay. Um, still working on that. Sean's working on the permission claim controller. I think this one is a task on the Epic. Uh, coordination controllers. Oh yeah, this is protected at the moment, I guess. So at some point, and this is a coordination topic we talk about sometimes. It will define an exception basically to that rule that you cannot accept. TBD. Yes. Probably zero nine or something. Yeah, but we'll get there. Yeah. Um, this one, I know Robin is starting to work on it. Um, I'm gonna put it on. Oh, I'm going to put it on eight. Um, this one. Oh, this is the one that we talked about where um, it was, yeah, that the universal bootstrapping code predates the initializer changes and not seeing children. No, this. I think I fixed 10 days ago, so this is older, right? So yeah. maybe, maybe this is fixed. Because it checks now not only the type, but it checks just the initializer or something. So I think it works. Uh, all right, well, we'll um... maybe ask Matus double check in code main. And the last one is a task under the epic. Some of these tasks may move to zero to eight. Yeah. Okay, and that's it. All right, um, I think we're at a good stopping point. So, oh wait, Chris, you wrote something. Um, is 7.99. Is this still relevant for sharding? I would say yes. Yeah, I, I wouldn't call, I mean, it's not blocking sharding, but of course we need a solution, right? Yes. So it's more like for deployment, which uses shards, yes, has value for sure. Not sure what we talked about there. Yeah, this is, this is a topic of, of 
client search and uh, if they are lost or leaked, we have to revoke them or something. I think it's around shard lifecycle. So as, as shards come and go, if they come and go dynamically, there needs to be a, a, a key list that the other shards recognize if they want to accept jots that for yeah, SAs signed which, by other shards. Which doesn't have to be in KCP, right? Could be, but doesn't have to. You'd have to balance. Like with the current mechanism, you'd have to balance all of the other shards to update the key list. Yeah. Um, so I think Luca shed some some links to that from prior work. Maybe you can restart the topic in Slack in a thread. Okay. Uh, I just added one in the comments. Thirteen eighty-eight. Yes, uh, I think this one. The plan is probably for me to restart on the already started task and and finish that for the end of the week. Um, the the impact behind this is that this would probably require uh, wiping the ATCD and and just ensuring that that everyone starts back uh, you know with all workspaces created in their home and not in organization workspaces and uh, top level or, or workspaces as as was before so that's quite a you know organizational and habit change also on the client side. Why would this impact pre-existing workspaces under orgs? Uh, is it just that the cluster role and role binding is? Yeah, the thing is that um, as soon as uh, there are, a number, you know, there are specific subject access review and, and checks on the virtual workspace for personal workspaces, especially uh, when we detect that the workspace created by someone is inside a top level org, then we don't check the same thing because we have to to be compatible with the previous checks, with the previous, you know, um, airbag rules that were different, the model was different. So for now we kept uh, the, the compatibility not to break everything, but at some point we have to, to break that, simplify things and assume that there is no uh, personal, you know, old style personal workspaces anymore, because at some point there would not be access. They would not be not be able to access them anymore. Okay. So doing this at the same time as we have the requirement to wipe ACD makes you know, the migration <laughs> much easier. So, are you just saying you want to pull this in for this week? Uh, yes, I have to come back into it because I was in the transformations mainly uh, the last days and the last week. But uh, that's that's the plan. That would be the plan yeah, to to switch back into it uh, very okay. very quickly because it's mainly updating quite a bunch of tests, <laughs> which we're testing heavily testing the the personal scope, which we don't have anymore. Is this anything this that can be? Um split up or is it really just like one person doing it on a one branch uh i can have a look to to this tomorrow when when coming back to it and and okay so update on the channel task, right? but but i think you know i already it's mainly just cutting the code and then seeing what what breaks in compilation and then what breaks in tests <laughs> mainly <laughs> makes sense Okay. All right. Well, we're at the top of the hour. So um, thanks, everybody. And hope you have a great Tuesday. Good rest of your week. And see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.